I want to talk about the things I know a little bit about, about, um, this is the title, it's quite a stupid title, it's about, uh, yeah, digital technology and poetry or language, or it has this subtitle or why poets need to program, I don't know if this is true, but anyway, um, I want to talk about uh, language technology, so, uh, I think language is never and has never been isolated from technology. Technology always influenced language. Uh, it started earlier, but maybe the first thing is when writing was introduced, it's also kind of a technology. So it surely changed language, it changed poetry, literature, all these things. Uh, or uh, typesetting, when the first books were printed, it changed literature, it changed the distribution but it also changed what you could write. Um, and typewriting as well changed how poets, how uh, authors wrote. And of course, computers are changing the whole thing again. Um, but computers are no typewriters, so they're, that's what most authors use the computer for, is for typewriting, so every, you could argue that uh, each all literature that's not written by hand is digital literature, so to say. But it can be can do much more. So computers can analyze language, they can combine elements of language, they can correct correct what is correct correct language, and they can interpret language. Um, for example, the things most people started realizing that computers can help or or. Uh, hinder language was the thing called, I don't know if it was called internationally like that, but it was called T9 when you had the first mobile phones, you were typing on, this, on these keys and they were, it was kind of suggesting uh, words and a lot of times were the wrong words, but then, I don't know, I w when I were communicated, I started using these wrong words as a kind of co words and it somehow worked. Or there are other things like the prediction keyboards on, on modern uh, smartphones or everybody has used translation, automatic translation, I guess. Um, but of course there's more, like the whole internet is a text medium. So even if you, if you look at a, a website that has a lot of graphics, the underlying structure is text. So uh, computers send texts, send a lot of text, they generate text, and they receive text. So most of the communication, or a lot of the communication is in text form. And they even perform text, they read text, they show text. So they also perform us in a way. And they, of course they manipulate text. So they change this text, they translate it internally, they, I don't know, change the, the color, the view, the typesetting, whatever. Um, and of course there's a lot of uh, stuff going on that we don't know about, or that we don't see necessarily, like uh, the search engines. They, they're coming through the websites and they try to understand these texts. So I started to think about how these search engines see text because obviously you notice sometimes that they don't understand it. So they have to have some kind of algorithm to uh, kind of find out what is necessary in order to, to provide the search. So what they do is, is uh, or what, one of, one of the things they do, they remove certain words, so-called stop words, so they remove, I don't know, articles, they remove things like and and or, so they to reduce it to keywords, and then what they, what they do, uh, the second step, in I guess a couple more steps, but they are not, also these, these, these uh, algorithms are not really uh, publicly uh, available, so you have to, people who are researching this, they guess what they do, or they, they um, have some ideas, but they don't know the total algorithms. So when, when these stop words are removed, they also remove or they, they uh, kind of reduce the words to its stems. So there's, for example, a word like walking would result into walk. So they have, most of the time, they have no ideas of, I don't know, flexions or tenses or whatever. And so they construct this kind of, kind of reduced, very simple text, and then they analyze and work with it. And I made this small experiment uh, how this could feel like, how this could sound like. And I used the text of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights uh, and uh, kind of reduced it with this 
two algorithms, like reducing or removing the stop words and reducing it to words, word stems, and it sounds like this. Is the sound? No. Oh, shit. Yeah, yeah, he's filming you. Sorry. Uh. Of mankind and advent of world in which human be shall enjoy freedom of speech and belief and freedom from fear and what has been proclaimed as highest asper of common PR where it is essentially if man is not to be compelled to have records as last resort to rebellion against tyranny and oppress that human right should be protected by rule of law where it is essentially to promote Develop a friend relat between nation where a PR of unit nation have in charter reaffirm their faith in fundament, human right and dignity and worth of human person and an equal right of men and women and have determined to promote social, progress and better standard of life in larger freedom where a member state have pledged themselves to achieve in Cooper with unit nation. Pro yeah, and so on. So that, that's kind of my attempt to, uh, to grasp how these algorithms could work. I'm not totally sure if this is really the case, but there are some hints that is maybe part of the processing. Um, yeah, so the idea is which information is lost in this process, or the, the, the question is, and how is this information selected? Uh, who does influence, and how does uh, this influence the writing, or could you write, uh, or people are actively trying to generate websites that uh, fit into this uh, in these uh, search algorithms more perfectly and to produce better results if you search for certain topics and things like this. So this is already uh, influencing like all these headlines you see. Uh, I don't know, you've probably seen this, these websites where it's, they're mainly made for clicking on it, uh, so-called clickbait, so people see it in their I don't know, social web, feed, social uh, media feed and just click on it because they sound so, I don't know, compelling. Um, yeah, and then there are other, other things happening, like um, a lot of the things I'm, I'm going to show are just in the beginning and uh, I'm just wondering how they would uh, affect language or literature in, in the future. So we had a lot of experiments in the past uh, of uh, computer programs try to chat with people and uh, just in recent years they, they made this personal assistance like on the Apple iPhone they have this agent called Siri which you can talk to and other, other smartphones you have similar things. So they try to, to chat with you and, and uh, I don't know, fulfill some tasks. Uh, and now with I don't know the, the more the the messenger apps getting more important, um, these companies try to uh, to think about how to to capture the people who are just messaging constantly and provide some services for them as computer programs so you can chat with them. For example, you can I don't know ask for the weather or for travel information, shopping guides, uh, Bible quotes, whatever. Or uh, things like, I don't know, I made this, this small dialogue with a chatbot uh, asking for poetry. Me, can you recite a poem? Clever bird, no, I don't know any. Me, can you write a poem? Clever bird, yes, but it's not very fun. Me, I don't care, tell me. Clever bird, you don't have to care. Me, please, write me a poem. Clever bird, for what do you need a poem? Me, for art's sake. Clever bird. Please be serious. Me, I am serious. Yeah, so he doesn't, he not really writing poetry. Um, but there are other things, like, I don't know, these scary things, like uh, so-called invisible girlfriend. I don't know this, who is this for, but you can fill out this form and uh, where did you meet your invisible girlfriend? And then uh, it's chatting and sending you text messages, uh, like an interactive and authentic experience. Um, <laughs> Yeah, but so that's the future because there's also invisible boyfriend, for example. But but not it's not yet a bot. So these are really people chatting with you if you if you subscribe to this service. But I guess in the future this could be a service. I don't know why. Yeah. So that's also also uh, I think the advent of text messaging when people first started writing each other text messages uh, influenced language. It changed language, and I'm asking, will these chatbots, because obviously in the beginning they won't be very bright, and they're still not very bright. Uh, they're sometimes only a simulation of it, but 
will it will this kind of uh, dump uh, chatbots influence language how we communicate and how um, and um, the, the reason why I'm now concerned with that is because all these things are changing like uh, this, this topic called machine learning there was a very old topic in artificial intelligence when I started to uh, uh, get interested in the computers, there was, you know, in the 80s or end of the 80s, there were all these huge predict predictions what would be possible in the year 2000, how computers would be, I don't know, bright and more intelligent than us. And it hasn't happened. But uh, in the last years, uh, this machine learning topic uh, kind of was renewed. Uh, and it's now called deep learning, so it's a new topic. But it's, it's the same things that they predicted. Uh, and it's basically computers learning without supervision, so they kind of learn by the inputs. Uh, and it was not possible in the 80s when they predicted it. But now there are some things happening, and uh, there are these things called artificial neural networks that are also an old concept of simulated neurons, of simulated brain cells with certain learning rules. And yeah, it's an old idea, but now the computer power is finally available to really get it to work. So a lot of these things like the translation engines and um, also maybe parts of the of these conversation engines are powered by these. Uh, but also other things like we show a thing to write poetry with that. Uh, and so for example, the next one is a program called Word Synth by Ross Goodwin. Um, and it's uh, it's a thing, it's called autocomplete, so it's, you can write a sentence and then press a key and then it uh, suggests I don't know, ways to continue. So we showed this video that just, so I started by a famous English beginning of a poem and then pressed the tab key and then it suggested this. And then again, so it, and then I wrote was, and I was just trying to work with that. So what this this program basically was, it was it was trained on on poetry. So it was trained on I don't know what what the what kind of poetry to, he used, uh, and tried to learn how to continue sentences. And there's this kind of bar in the in the bottom where you can I don't know. Uh, enter the temperature in order to have uh, no more um, more correct uh, kind of learn things or or I don't know more freedom for so to say. So this is kind of helping to write poetry, but it can also write prose and things like this. Yeah, it's, maybe it's not great, but it's it's the beginning, and a lot of this this um, the, the, and 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 what what interesting thing is it's not that this computer program was told some rules how to write these things, but it was just learning on on the text it had, and it was just trying because what what it does is basically to find out if you if you have a word, uh, it learns the context of the words. So if it, I don't know if you have this word like uh, first, then it uh, has learned the context of how likely it would be to continue with uh, lady or or what, what could be the next word and the next word and, the, and, and so on. So it's like almost like humans learn how to speak. It's learned by, by hearing. Um, yeah, I leave that one out um, because I want to come to an end. Um, but it's also also working, so that one is working with text, but it's also working with, with sound and with language. Uh, language sound, and this is an experiment I found on the, on the web. I don't know actually the author because it was kind of almost anonymous video. And it's learning from a Japanese, uh, I think, manga voice, I don't know. And it's learning by also by imitation. So it's the same technology as, as the text. It, it just hears uh, the text and tries to get more and more uh, precise and more, uh, more correct in a way. So I, I first play the original. It sounds like this. Yeah, so, and then uh, it 
takes a lot of training steps. So after 2,000 iteration, iterations of the program hearing it, um, it sounds like this. So still some problems, but after after seventy uh, after seventy three thousand, it sounds like this. Yeah, again, this, this is not supervised, so the, the program is, has not got any rules beforehand how to learn it. It just learns it by hearing. Um, it's, I think, don't think that that's a meaningful Japanese language, but it very uh, clearly imitates the original in a way. Yeah, so that's what I wanted to show. I just wanted to have some, I, I just some uh, things that concern me because why I think it's important or why I, I uh, think about these things. Um, because there are a lot of problems with all this language technology. First, one that concerns me personally is uh, I, I speak German as a native language, and uh, a lot of these things uh, only work for English, and I'd like to experiment more, more with, the, with other languages. But because uh, technology is so prominently uh, or so important in, or so big in, in uh in English-speaking countries, there's not much resources uh, to work on that. Then there's also always the problems, of course, because I also come from Austria, which is even a more, uh, yeah, subset of the of the German language. There's also the problem of dialects. So all these things, never think about dialects. There's this uh, hilarious uh, video of two Scots in an elevator stuck because the elevator only reacts to voice and they cannot bring it to, fu to function. So that's even, even uh, I, I think what generally happens, at least in Austria, is that um, language is more and more streamlined, so to say. So uh, in media there's no, or media influences people so that the dialects are, are disappearing. And I think these technology things will also, will kind of further that. And of course, because of all these things are made and almost necessarily made by huge companies because they have the resources. It's always kind of corporate language, so they think well, what language should be modeled, how language should be modeled. Uh, and of course, this results in a power struggle because it's hard to do this independently, how to, I don't know, uh, create your own algorithms like this. So it's obviously a question, who is in control of these technologies? Who is in control of language? Yeah. Uh, because this is a processing power and things like that. So I don't want, want to go in detail. So what's your, what could be the role of experimental literature in this regard? So for me, it starts with uh, reflecting this whole thing. Like uh, when I try to work with that, I try to find out how these things work, how to experience this technology because uh, I want to, yeah, I want just to get hold of this whole thing. Um, and also maybe to demonstrate how these things work, uh, what, how to influence and somehow um, get some awareness of it. And also project it into the future because, uh, as I said, I think it's only the beginning and uh, I really don't know what it would be in 10 years, 20 years, but maybe it's a way to grasp a tiny idea of how this would be in the future. So, yeah, the, the thing of uh, people, poets should be programmers is provocative, of course, but I think it's important for me or for a subset of, of people working with that, it's important to learn to understand how these things work, what shapes language technology, and of course, how to subvert it in a way, because that's what I love to do, uh, and how to create a, maybe a more humanistic technology, more human, and also, yeah, how to destroy capitalism, because, no, because that's, that's why these things are, are uh, I don't know, language used to be a, a common good, and when, when th these huge companies, what's already happened, what happened in the last uh, 50 years, that they, I don't know, that commercials influenced language. But this will be much bigger, because 
that's how I don't know. That's how in, you interface with with technology, with necessary technology. Uh, so that will change things, of course. So, but seriously, uh, yeah. <laughs> Thank you.